Well, I hope you have your Bibles with you this morning as, uh, as we tackle a broad passage for the entire, we're going to try and cover the entire third chapter of the book of Jonah. And, uh, and so you'll have to, you have to stay on pace uh, with me because I'll be asking a lot of questions as, uh, as I've been processing through. And you'll need to be looking at your Bible. Sometimes I'll mention a verse, please look at it. Look at it. If you need to, circle it, underline it, uh, whatever the case might be, because it, it, the story really begins to jump and pop here. Although the first two ver- uh, chapters are simply a background to what God is really going to start doing. So I've been asked over and over again in my 45, almost 45 plus years of ministry, Gordon, what's your next step in the church? What do you, what, where, where are you going to take the church next when you, where you're serving? Gordon, in the conference, uh, what's the next step in helping this committee move from this place to this place? And I have to imagine that uh, that might have been the question Jonah was asking himself. Maybe this the question that we should ask ourselves, not literally, but What would you do if you had been vomited out of a fish? Hmm. Yeah, maybe take a shower, someone in the... You see, I started to think and process through that, and and just a whole host of things came to mind about what many of us might consider doing. I mean, if you lived in the world we live in today, you'd probably start a reality show, right? Right? Maybe do some interviews, share your story with the, with the world. If you started, a re- you would call it the Jonah Show. And if you were offered a host position on a national television talk show, you might say something like, I am Jonah and this is my world. Or maybe if, if perchance that you had, had come to some realization that It was a spiritual experience being cloitered into that belly of the fish and you'd come to this aha moment about God that maybe you'd start a church. You'd call it Church of the Whales. I mean, we would take all kinds of creative liberties to use this experience to try and catapult ourselves into some kind of position of some fame and and maybe even a few dollars in our pocket. After all, who knows when that next experience like that will come your way. But what do you do if you're Jonah? I mean, at at this point, Jonah waits for God to tell him what to do next. I mean, that would be a moment of, a place of comfort for many of us. Okay, God, you got my attention. Now don't say anything else, God. I understand what you're saying. But don't say anything else. But in Jonah's case, he didn't have to wait very long. Look at the the third chapter, verses 1 and 2. It says very clearly, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And he said, you go, Jonah, to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. I don't want you to take your life experience, Jonah. I don't want you to take your education in in priesthoodness. I don't want you to bring bring all your baggage with you, Jonah. I am going to tell you exactly what to say. I think I underlined, I don't think, I underlined in my Bible a second time. Because that seems to be our M.O. That we believe that God is a God of second chances. And God often is. But let me say this. Start reading through your Old Testament and even your New Testament. And you'll find out that not everyone in the Bible got a second chance. That's hard to hear, my friends. I know that 
many of my colleagues and peers, when I was talking to them about, here's the sermon that I, I think that, that I'm going to, to bring out of this passage, they would say, well, Gordon, 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 Gordon. Now, um, just remember that, that God is a God of second chances, right? And I said, what about Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts? Oh, go back into the Old Testament in Genesis and ask, what about Lot's wife? All she did was take a peek. It's not like she was going to run back there. She just took a peek. Or check out King Saul, who was removed from his kingship because of his sinful rebellion against God. No second chance. I mean, the fact that God gave Jonah a second chance does not mean that we will always be given a second chance when we disobey God. We need to hear this because, you see, we often read the book of Jonah and we say Jonah ran away, Jonah was disobedient, Jonah didn't listen, and so on. And look, uh, it was his first time that he did that. And so the first time doesn't matter with God, but it does. We think I'll always get a second chance, not necessarily. I guess I would say it in this way. We cannot presume on God's second chance grace. Let's keep the Bible in balance, my friends. Let's keep it in balance. Let's not just pick and choose this little section here and say, this is how God will always operate. You see, the really encouraging truth for me is that Jonah's, in Jonah's disobedience, uh, that Jonah's disobedience did not cancel God's call on his life. Sometimes we believe that's all we have to do. If God says, Gordon, do this, and I say, no, all right, that thing that God wants me to do is over. But that's not the case. God's call for Jonah to go to Nineveh was a continual call. And so when the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, it was like, Jonah, listen, you go to Nineveh, and I'm going to give you the word so that you do not mess this up. And that's good news and bad news, isn't it? The good news is God hasn't given up on Jonah. The bad news is God hasn't given up on Nineveh. I mean, this is a lose-lose for Jonah. So I paused, and I began to think, all right, Gordon, where would you find yourself in this? What are some of the important things just from those first two verses that, that really jump out at me and, and ask the important and the difficult questions in my life? The first thing that I discovered is that God doesn't hold grudges. If we disobey, God doesn't hold a grudge. God says, go back, get it done. And, and, and in that same line of thought, God doesn't negotiate with us. I think that's where we often think that, you know what, we turn around and say, this is what we're willing to do for you, God. And that's not the way the relationship works. We, God doesn't negotiate when we rebel against God's ways and God's will in our lives. Oh, yes, God may give us a second chance to follow through, but it doesn't change the fact that God could say, okay, there's someone else in line. Secondly, is that, that God doesn't lighten the load. It, the, the message is the same. You go to the cruel group of people in, in Nineveh, and you turn around and you tell them, this is the way it is. Thirdly is that God doesn't give up. I mean, if all God cared for was Nineveh and the Ninevites, he could have gotten somebody else. 
I mean, the good news is God cares for us as well and wants us to be in right relationship and obedient to God and God's ways. In fact, I, I kind of look at it this way, that God really knew that Jonah had this evilness inside of him. And, and he wanted Jonah to confront this evil in his own heart because if we allow evil to continue, prejudice to continue, sin to continue in our lives, it will tear us apart and we will be lost from God. God wanted to take that evil and change it and say, Jonah, these are people I love too. Now, again, I put myself in God's view and, and God's perspective, but I, I go and I take Jonah's perspective now, and I, Jonah hears these exact words, you get up, you hoof it to Nineveh. That enough would bring fear. I mean, fear. He knew all about the bloodthirsty atrocities that, that the Assyrians committed. And, and I can imagine if I'm sitting there and I heard that and I was Jonah, I'd say, are you sure, God? I don't think that, I think that seaweed's still in my ears. Because I know what they do and how they do, and I won't last 10 minutes there. She, aren't you sure, God, that you can use me someplace else where my ministry will be longer than 10 minutes? I mean, I'll be a corpse before I get the word God out. Well, then there might have been shame. I mean, he failed the first time, and that, how do I know that I'm not going to get closer each step I take, and that shame that I didn't do the first thing, and I, oh. And finally, I think the deepest part is that continued hatred for all that none of us stood for. <laughs> So I come to this conclusion, even though there is this moment of despair in this, in this belly of this fish, it hasn't changed who Jonah is. He still has a deep disgust for the Assyrians. He still wanted them and wanted God to send them directly down to hell. I mean, the third verse says that Jonah obeyed. Look at that. He obeyed the word of God and went to Nineveh. I'm sure pouting. I mean, before this, Jonah had a stinky attitude against what God was asking. After this uh, whale situation, this fish situation, he still has a stinky attitude. But he obeys God's call, which leads me to this other thought that I had. How many times have we been asked to do things that we really don't like, and we do it anyway? I mean, for example, taking out the garbage is not my favorite thing. Picking up socks isn't my favorite thing. but yet we do it anyway, don't we? Isn't it interesting we'll do something like that, but we won't take the same principle for God's work? But I give Jonah his due. He got up off the beach, cleaned himself off, headed for Nineveh, and I say, good for you, Jonah. which then brought me to a whole other set of questions. I think it's an important, it's an important principle. One that we often fall trap in, uh, to and in. We say that we've got, we're going to do the big plan for, the big plan, dream big, and yet we never obey. In God's books, a small, obedient step always beats our great intentions. Always. Let me say that again, because I think that's important for us as disciples to understand that our small step of obedience 
always beats the great intentions that we want to project. Nothing wrong with big plans, but in God's eyes, that small step of obedience beats big plans any day. We can dream about tomorrow, we can imagine incredible things, but until we're faithful for today, it means nothing. And so Jonah set out for Nineveh, each step, I think, taking him on a collision course between his prejudice and the Ninevite arrogance. And then put together there the overarching theme of of the unlimited love of God. I like what the third verse says. Now Nineveh was, and what does your Bible say? wonder why that is. I mean, they're ruthless, right? They're godless, right? They don't even know what it is to follow God's ways. How could that be a very important city? I mean, they worshiped idols, right? If you go back and you read the history of the Assyrians, you'll find that that they were given over to greed. They were always looking for the for the coin here and the gold there, and they were always looking to to build their treasure chest of wealth, given over to immorality. It mattered not who you slept with, whether you're married or not. It didn't matter if it was a child or an adult. And violence that was so bloodthirsty. I mean, just... Having one hair, which is all I got, out of position, could get you done in. I mean, these people in Nineveh knew nothing about God and about the Bible. And God says, this is an important city to me? I mean, this city is so important that it's on my heart, Jonah. Oh, I I thought about playing a song, but... We have so much to get through. God loves people everywhere. I think it's Amy Grant that sings that song. Or no, it's Point of Grace. It's Point of Grace. I think it's four or five ladies that sing that song. God loves people everywhere. God loves the places where people know nothing about God. God loves people who who live in great darkness. Not not my notes, but Catherine and I were blessed to serve a church and they had very low attendance. They were dying. And the bishop had sent me down there to to figure out what was going on and how to revive their their spirit and their and and how to help them grow in their faith and grow in the community that they were there to serve. And I said in a council meeting, and someone said, Pastor, you're not bringing enough people into the church. And I said, excuse me, but I think that's your job. My job is to help nurture them while they're, when they come. So why aren't you inviting people to the church? And they said, well, we don't know anybody who's not. I I said, your neighbors? All of our neighbors are Christian. I said, are you serious? They said, yes, every one of our neighbors are Christians. To the left, north, south, east, they're Christians. And so I just let the pause there for a minute. I said, well done, good and faithful church. You've accomplished your mission. It's time we sell this building, and it's time that we move to a place where people don't know God. All of a sudden, they found a lot of people. And they started growing and thriving. And the church became vibrant, became one of the places where people were wanting to come. That's what God is about. God is is looking for places where people don't know about the love and grace of God. In the last several years, I've been reading demographics on a different level, and the demographics are are fascinating. They talk about the great movements of people. And what they say is for the first time, 
in history, more people live in darkness of their own making. It's all about me, self. I, I grab this, I want that, this is mine, it's not yours. But you see, for the longest time, for thousands of years, people who believed in good have far outnumbered people who think and live evil lives. It's switched. Just look at your news. Take a peek at the news and the reports that you hear of people living today who have no reflection of goodness and godliness in their lives. We're living in a world that is increasingly evil. And unless God finds those people important, which God does, that trend will only continue. We have to love the people that are unlovable. I like the hymn that, that Frank North penned about the frantic pace of life, and it's called Where the Cross and Crowded Ways of Life. Just let me just read the first verse of that. Where cross and where cross the crowded ways of life, where sound of cries of race and calm, above the noise of selfish strife, we hear your voice, O Son of Man, O Jesus. God cares about those who are lost. They're very important to him. It matters not where they live, whether they're in the, the mega cities that are teeming millions of individuals that crowd together or where it's a specific location. God cares for the lost in Mexico City, Tokyo, Manila, Beijing, Port of Prince. God cares for New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and even Columbus. God cares where there's godlessness, even in the village of Sunbury which will soon grow to a city and become a suburb of Columbus. God cares about those who are lost on the farm, those who live in isolated places. God's asking us to have the same heart. That's what he was asking Jonah. It goes beyond our reasonable calculations about this is the most, this is the most profitable mission field. This is the most most practical way in which we can do this. This is the best way to finance. All those are out the window when we turn it over to God. Now remember, Jonah came from a rural region in Israel, <laughs> going to a big city where people hated God and hated anybody who represented God. Verses 3 and 4 inform me that that they took that Jonah took three days. We might think that uh, it was the walk through every part of the city would take three days, but when you look at the commentators on this, uh, the debate is something like this. Uh, that includes all the surrounding suburbs of Nineveh, which no doubt there were. There was the walled city of Nineveh, but those that are surrounding, possibly 600,000 people would be associated with that city. It would be like us asking, what's the population of Columbus? And you would ask, well, is that downtown Columbus? Or does that include Dublin? Are, are you talking about all the boroughs, Clintonville and, and, and all those around? Or are you just talking about downtown? And that's what most commentaries say about this. So Jonah starts his trek through this important city where people know nothing about God. And he doesn't coat the message. It's a message directly from God. God does not coat a message against sin. Eight words. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Fourth verse. That's the whole message. Eight words in English. Be surprised. In Hebrew, it only consists of four words. Four words. My friends, try to boil down the message of Jesus Christ into a very succinct message. We get all off on these other tangents of things, and the message gets lost. 
God knows that the direct approach is always the best approach. Your life is not lived right with God. Do you want to make a change? Oh, we say that'll scare people away. That will, that will turn them away. They'll be angry. Well, they'll be angry with the messenger, God. The one who gave the message to each of us to proclaim. To be honest, I've never preached an eight-word message in my entire life. Just saying. Eight words. Forty more days. Oh, we'd say it's even a depressing message, right? Wouldn't we want to say... Listen, in 40 days, you got a chance to really experience God's grace. Are you in? Maybe? All right, we might be able to slip at the 42 or so. You know, God might be distracted. I can imagine someone saying, who is this guy? Does he know who we are? <laughs> what's, what's that? You know he just arrived in Nineveh, right? He doesn't know us at all. I mean, how can he have a message like that when, when he just arrived? He's not from around here. That's what I hear. I can imagine when Jonah gives his, his four-word message, 40 days, someone's saying, his accent's a little strange. I can imagine the message being said and someone said, well, doesn't he smell like rotten fish or something? I mean, let me tell you how we would do it. Uh, we'd start to put together a Nineveh for Jesus campaign, wouldn't we? Uh, we'd hire an advanced team. We'd get a PR person together to put an ad campaign in place, buy billboard space, get the social media blitz going, uh, start a Facebook page, uh, get our Twitter team up and running, make some Nineveh for Jesus t-shirts, do some training, set up buses and carts to bring people from the surrounding areas. We'd, we'd have follow-up uh, material printed and ready to go. We'd set up several key homes to where we could have prayer meetings to, to bathe this, this effort in, in, in prayer. And we'd, we'd arrange for simultaneous uh, translations for those that are visiting Nineveh. And then we'd rehearse the choir, and we'd have a snazzy uh, slogan, Organize Operation Nineveh. In the meantime, the uh, pastor would have to raise about $3 million just to get us started. Yeah, Jonah skipped all that. A four-word negative sermon. No chance of success, right? Oh, people ask, what's your plan for, for uh, what, what, what's your plan for reaching Nineveh? Oh, we're sending Jonah. Isn't he the one who ran away? Yes. Well, what's he going to do there? He's going to walk around and preach a, a four-word sermon. Four words? Yeah. Well, if that doesn't work, what, what do you got planned, God. All along, Jonah's saying, I got this in the bag. God's going to destroy them. And I'm going to be a hero back in, in my home country. I can say this, because I've seen it over the years of pastoral ministry, that many of our churches preach cheap grace. You got plenty of time. Don't worry about it. You're on a journey tell you, the real conversions are the ones that have an immediate turnaround. Even if you've been on the journey a long time, there's an immediate turnaround. Stand back, it doesn't look like there's much hope. But five tells the story, the Ninevites believe God. I like that. It doesn't say, and they believed Jonah and turned. No, they skipped the prophet. They went straight to God. I mean, that says it all. Revealing that genuine nature of, of faith. 
And unless and we say that conversion really takes time to grab hold of us and change our lives, look at what they did. Immediately, a fast was proclaimed, all of them, from the greatest to the least, we're told, put on sackcloth. The king stood up. That's a sign of serious intent in the Assyrian culture. When, you, when the king stands up and says, I am serious about this. He removed his royal robes, which is a sign of humility in his day and his culture. He covered himself in sackcloth, which is a sign of mourning for his people and for his life. And he sat in dust. Kings don't sit in dust. That's a sign of repentance. And then he sends out a call for all to have a time of fasting and prayer because he says, who knows? God may yet relent from this message and, and with compassion turn God's fierce anger so that we will not perish. Even the mighty king of Nineveh gets it. And you know what? Jonah doesn't. I mean, this whole city repented, and we've seen nothing like this, even with our great revivals. George Whit Whitfield never saw it, neither did D.L. Moody. Billy Sunday never saw results like this, and nothing ever happened in the worldwide ministry of Billy Graham. A whole pagan city believed God. It would be like saying that Tokyo, all of Tokyo, all of China, and even closer, can you imagine if all of Columbus heeded this forward message and turned their hearts not to Sunbury UMC, but to God? It would be like saying that, that everyone in Dhaka became a devoted Christian, or the whole city of San Francisco became right with God. Cincinnati got on its knees. Columbus they surrendered themselves to the will of God. Unbelievable. And yet it happened. Because this is what the story tells us. God is the one that is in charge. God knows the hearts that are ripe for revival. They didn't know it, but God did. Now look at the end of the story in verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God had compassion. That God was busy working. I asked myself, well, how, how, how much faith do you have to have to believe in God? Not much, as long as it's real faith. And it doesn't get... It doesn't get get uh, diluted with our own personal agendas. Oh, someone turn, someone turn to Luke 11.32 and read that out loud for us, please. Luke 11, verse 32. You see, even, even in the Gospels, it's saying, you know what, you're going to be judged more harshly because the people who were godless turned to God. They began to obey God. I personally believe there's going to be thousands of Ninevites in heaven because they turned their hearts to God. They responded. You see, it's our responsibility, my friends. It's our responsibilities to turn our hearts to God so that God can use us. But the question is this, and this is where we find ourselves in many of our churches across the United States, can God save Jonah? God can save those who are ruthless, evil, and, and beyond, beyond any comprehension that they can change their ways, but can God change us, save us as Christians who have, who have built up all these years of things that, that get in the way of our faith and God working through us? Have we started preaching our own message instead of the message that God has given us to preach to the world? So I suggest you read the fourth chapter. 
in preparation for next week, our last message in the series on Jonah. Would you pray with me? Most holy God, as we have heard your words this morning, we pray that you would send your word into our community, not only our community of faith, but our community of uh, Sunbury. And I would pray that you would use your people here at, at SUMC to make a difference in the lives of others. I ask that you would make this the moment in which that happens, to banish our unbelief, increase our faith, and do once again what you did in Jonah's day. Therefore, I ask that you would give your people here at SUMC a heart for this community, that we may not fail in the task of reaching our generation here for Jesus Christ. For we pray in his holy name. Amen.